To me, Lehman was never rotten at the core. That's where all the beauty was. She was rotten at the head. I think anywhere between two to five years to be some type of debt jubilee or debt reset. The sliver of equity in Deutsche Bank is this. And people look at the stock and like, oh, I can buy the stock at $12 or $11. Think of a pie. You own this little tiny sliver and all of the rest of the pie is senior to you. Elon Musk is a genius politically. He spent a ton of time on the Hill. The only way you can survive is if you get your boys in Washington to protect you with tariffs for the next two, three, four years. I thought this government's supposed to be anti-tariffs. Oh, <laughs> yeah. You know, I'm really excited to meet my next guest. Larry McDonald and I have kind of run parallel lives because we started the industry about the same time. We've worked for different firms, but we have a lot of friends in common. And interesting enough, I found out recently that Larry and I even dated the same girl. So it's, it's going to be a fascinating conversation. We're going to learn a lot about Larry's career, which is always interesting. I think there's a lot of value to be learned from how people manage their careers. I think for many of you viewers out there who are in their careers or or at the start of their careers, that's always an interesting thing and there's always learning to be had. But also, Larry, Larry's career came across one of the biggest things that happened in the whole financial industry of our lifetimes, which was the collapse of Lehman Brothers, and he happened to write the book about it. It was the definitive book about it um, at the time and a New York Times bestseller. So he was at the right place at the right time. And then after that, he started Bear Traps Report and also runs various other research projects. And his viewpoint is always different, always interesting. So we're going to spend some time with Larry and dig into his views on the world, find out where he thinks the opportunities lie, coming from that kind of distressed bond um, way of looking at things. And I think it'll add some definite value to all of us. Larry, great to finally meet. I can't believe we haven't met before. We've got so many friends in common. And for you to come here from Panama to the Cayman Islands, so from one Caribbean paradise to another, you know, it's just it's great to finally meet and get you on camera. And now I know why. Now I know why more people come here in the winter time. They love Cayman, Grand Cayman in February. I mean, God bless it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, who wants to be in New York? <laughs> so, look, I'd love for you. Um, people have seen you on Real Vision and um, seen you express some of your ideas, but I'm not sure they know who you are and some of your story. So, I'd love for you to give some of the story of what makes Larry Larry and, and where you've come from in your career. Well, I grew up on Cape Cod, and uh, but, but just before that, it was up toward uh, outside of Boston, Bolton, Massachusetts, and very tough divorce. And I went through as a child, my parents. I think we were in probably six or seven schools for in eight years, and uh, then finally, uh, you know, we went from very countryside living to living in a housing project uh, and through the divorces. And as a young man, I really learned uh, how to appreciate money, hard work. And uh, finally made it, it made it into UMass, kind of came up through the boot, bootstraps, uh, public school systems, and started off uh, my career that way. And uh, it's, it's been very challenging, but I uh, got, got our first break uh, year, years later, which we can get into. Yeah, you told me about this <laughs> off camera earlier. So, you, so you, you graduate and then you want to go to Wall Street. I want to get into Wall Street and... Um, I think I had 155 no's from every yeah, single... Yeah, I was there too. <laughs> yeah, we is. talked about I've got a drawer still <laughs> drawer full of them. The and I, the, I the motivation, uh, and to me... What we're showing you here on our YouTube channel is just the tip of the iceberg. No matter where you are in your financial journey, whether you're a beginner just looking to break into the market or a financial professional looking to up your game, Real Vision has something for everyone. Every day our team of expert journalists provides in-depth analysis, written reports, access to live streams, and access to our community, The Exchange, where you can interact with people just like you from all over the world. For just $1, you can unlock all of this and more at realvision.com. Try our essential tier. If you like what you see, it's only 20 bucks a month thereafter. So click on the link in the description, go to realvision.com, and see what you think. We look forward to seeing you there. I think I had 155 no's from every yeah, single... Yeah, I was there too. <laughs> yeah, we is. talked about I've got a drawer still <laughs> drawer full of them. The and I, the, I the motivation, uh, and to me, you know, life is about um, really that burning desire to break through those walls. I mean, nothing's given to you, and you, you have to go get it, and you have to really 
uh, have that burning desire of vision every day. And um, I couldn't figure out a way, but there's always a way. If you can't get through the door, you gotta climb in through the back window. And uh, Doyle Bronson used to say. And um, I tried to get into Merrill Lynch after like the seventh no. I snuck my way in dressed as a pizza delivery man. Yeah, to the, For real? Uh, yeah, in Philadelphia. I, I mean, Boston, I, I'd struck out so many times, so I tried Philly. And uh, I was thrown out of the building. On the way out, one of the senior producers of the firm, uh, Gary Begno, grabbed me and, uh, and brought me back. And he said, he brought me into a room with five or six big producers. And they said, uh, Larry, we'll give you a job. Just you got to go sell something for six months. Prove that you can build relationships with people. And I'm like, what, what am I going to sell? And the guy said, pork chops. And so I went back to the Cape and uh, Massachusetts, five, six months, put up some decent numbers. And uh, next thing you know, they gave me a job. Selling pork chops. <laughs> selling pork chops. But how did you start selling pork chops? I just worked my way into one of these, I think it was American frozen foods. <laughs> and it was during the uh, SNL crisis. Right. And we're talking about uh, trying to get a job in finance, coming out of school with Hundreds, and Bank of New England went out of business. I mean, Bank of, Bank of Boston was on the verge of filing. So the whole area yeah. of New England was going, you know, really near depression. Yeah. And, um, and so I just made my way uh, through the back door. So then after Merrill, so where did your career go from there? I was on the retail side for a couple of years and uh, really always wanted to be into, into that major league. To me, uh, to me, I wanted to get into New York and, and work on the institutional side of the business. With yeah. that. And that just fascinated me. Uh, and um, I had a, my good friend, Steve Seafeld. Uh, he, he and I were talking about a vision for bringing convertible bonds to the web. And this is like in the mid 90s. And we started a website called convertbond.com. We were lucky enough to have CNBC do a couple of segments on us. So it was very early for websites. And yeah, it was, it was late 95, 6. Yeah, just, that was just the early construction of it. Yep. But by the time we sold it to Morgan Stanley, it was October of 99. And uh, if we had waited, we sold the company. This was the largest, most successful convertible bond research, potentially trading platform in, in the world. And Morgan Stanley bought us in October of 99. And I, uh, I often say, if we had, if we had waited for the next bid, we never would have gotten it, because the market collapsed in 2000. And uh, God bless Morgan Stanley. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, top tick in the market because yeah. it had a dot com at the end of it. Yeah. So after that, so after you sell convertiblebond.com, what happens? Well, I stayed there. It was a very nice quality of life. I'm in Connecticut, New York, running the convertible sales. I'm running the, really the website for. Morgan Stanley probably stayed there one or two extra years. It was very comfortable, but uh, always wanted to make it onto the trading side. Mm -hmm. uh, and to me, that was really the, where I wanted to be. And um, once again, you know, if you have to, if you can't get through the front door, you're going to come in through the back door and, or the window. And um, I convinced Larry McCarthy and uh, the team at Lehman to give me a job uh, trading convertible bonds, high yield bonds, distress bonds. So I made uh, that was my big break, making it from kind of a on the, on the sales side, research side, into trading. And that was probably the biggest break of my career. Okay, and so what kind of convertible bonds? So you're, in that, you're now in New York trading, what, you know, what kind of strategies are you looking at? Well, it's really distressed converts, high yield converts, because what we realize is that the businesses, on, when you work on a big bank, you have the equity division and you've got the fixed income division. And most people don't realize that a lot of these divisions don't like each other. And so there's a lot of mis back then there was a lot of miscommunication between divisions across the street. And so my job was to really work with both sides and uh, help bring uh, markets, bring convertible bond markets to uh, clients around the world, but also make sure that our teams on all the different floors and high yield distressed and equities were on the same vision. So explain to people, because some people won't understand what a convert bond is, because yeah. you know it, it's the hybrid nature, and when you're doing distressed convert yeah. convertible bonds, you've got multiple hybrids here. So explain to people what that is. Well, I, I say in the book, and uh, I, I ended up, I wrote the New York Times bestseller about Lehman. It's now uh, it's now published in twelve languages. And one of the parts of the book is about converts. And there's a convertible indicator. If, if you look throughout the history of corporate capital markets and financing, the repeat 
entries to the convertible markets are oftentimes uh, the most likely companies to file bankruptcy, uh, whether it be Six Flags or Fannie and Freddie. Uh, there's so many different companies, WorldCom, Adelphia, the multiple convertible issuer. It's really the last saloon. So a convertible bond is uh, a obligation of the company. So you sell the bond, maybe a five or 10 year bond, a thousand face bond, and it may be a five year term, but you also have a conversion ratio, a certain amount of shares of stock. And what happens throughout the, 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 the evolution of some companies is they get too much in debt. Uh, companies like Calpine. Calpine had seven convertible bonds before they filed bankruptcy. And um, they will come to, it's really what we call the, the last saloon, that bar at two o'clock in the morning when you have to get that last drink. It's the place where a lot of companies can go and finance. And uh, lo and behold, Guess who the new multiple issuer is in, in, in the markets? It's now looking like a, a Tesla. <laughs> oh, right, interesting. So let, again, sorry, just to explain a bit about convertible bonds. So yep. as you say, it's a bond, but it has an equity component. How does that work? Just so people can understand truly how so, it works. So you have a thousand face bond, and there's a certain bond floor, bond floor in there, potentially, because it's an obligation of the company. But you'll have a certain number of shares of stock that the bond converts into. So if, if the stock takes off, you can have a $1,000 bond go to three or four or 5,000. In the, in the dot-com era, um, there were convertible bonds that went from 1,000 face. So you have a, a bond that's 1,000, it matures in five years at 1,000, but you have a potential of turning that 1,000 face into five or 10,000. Because, because there's of, a call option on the equity. Yeah, call option, that's, that's a good way of putting it. It's a certain amount of shares, but essentially it's an embedded call. And it has a strike price, like a call. Yes, it has which, a strike price. Of which you convert. You can and, convert and, and if you're Buffett, you, ne you negotiate the very <laughs> low strike prices. <laughs> Buffett's famous for converts. I mean, he convinced Goldman and uh, General Electric right. during the financial crisis to structure him a con private convertible bond that he has between him. It's, a, it's, a, it's an obligation between him and the company. He loans the company money, but he wanted that income component, that coupon, uh, yeah, that's your income, but uh, you also have a low, in his case, he negotiated a low conversion price. So let's just say the stock is $80 or uh, he might, his convert might convert at say 85 or 86. Um, but in the, in the case of other converts that are issued, a lot of times there's a bigger spread. So, so it's, it's like, when does that bond get in the money is the question. When can he convert? And Buffett's yeah. the classic in that regard. Yeah. So you're now at Lehman, you're trading. Talk me through the trading at Lehman. Well, our big break was uh, we, we, we had Jane Castle. Jane's now at uh, Avenue Capital with Mark Lasry, and Jane was one of our leading distressed analysts at the time, really an up-and-coming star. And Delta Airlines went into bankruptcy, so we're on the desk, and we were making markets for clients. And I'll never forget the day Delta filed. I started making the bonds at 16 bid, 17 offer, 16, 16 and a half. Back then, pretty decent spreads. And uh, by the middle, uh, late in the afternoon, uh, late, in, maybe toward four or five o'clock, we started to get hit down at 12 cents on the dollar uh, because there was, a lot of, there was a lot of global competition coming in with price pressure on airlines. There was threat, strikes threatened. The, the, the unions were extremely strong back then with the airlines. And so we were trading the bonds and uh, lo and behold, we, over the course of the next year, year and a half, we built up at Lehman, a $780 million position between the four of us, four, four traders uh, in, in Delta Airlines bonds. <laughs> so, How many bonds were in issuance? Uh, I think they probably had uh, three or four billion in debt. Right. Okay. So we owned, we owned a good chunk of them. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, so, so what we would do is we'd, we would make the markets for the clients. And so we had a sales force that would make the markets for the clients. But back then, Wall Street banks were allowed to hold uh, large amounts of inventory of bonds. So we, we, we had a number of bonds that we were able to, what we call proprietary trading. And so then in this whole story, you end up writing a book about Lehman. What was the book called and, and, what was sure. it, and why, why did you write it and what happened, the timing of writing that book? Well, to me, Lehman was never rotten at the core. That's where all the beauty was. She was rotten at the head. I mean, to me, Lehman was... 24,992 people making money and eight guys losing it. Right. And it was really about um, 
watching some of the people I loved and cared about, lives just destroyed, that inspired me. But in the summer of 2008, uh, thank God I had the vision uh, to, to pitch uh, a good friend of mine, old family friend, I think he has a place here in the Cayman, Patrick Robinson, right. had just written Lone Survivor, which was a number one New York Times bestseller, became a movie with Mark Wahlberg, and it was about the American hero Marcus Luttrell from Texas. And Marcus was the one of four Navy SEALs in Afghanistan that finally survived. And, and it was an incredible tale of heroism and uh, surviving and inspiration. And I, I, I read that book. And um, I, in the summer of 2008, we were up on Cape Cod. It was a beautiful night, 4th of July. The fireworks had just gone off. We're sitting at a table of eight or nine people. And I start to to pitch very gently Patrick on thinking about a Lehman book. And the whole table starts laughing. I was the laughing stock at the table because I quickly learned that throughout the, at the summers on the Cape, everybody pitches Pat, Patrick a book idea. Right. I mean, it happens like every night. <laughs> and uh, he, he said, Larry, he said, Larry, please, please don't disturb me. I said, I'm working on Shimon Perez's memoirs. I'll be, he says, I'm booked until 2000. This is, remember, this is the summer of 2008, because I'm booked solid till 2010. And as the old salesman in me, I, you know, you never take no for an answer. You just, there's always a way. Yeah. There's always a way to find and, and get that direction to what you want in life. So I said, <laughs> Patrick, do you understand something? And the whole table is quiet. I said, if this bank goes down, it'll be bigger than Enron, WorldCom, Adelphia, and even General Motors combined. And I'll never forget, he had that uh, Chivas Regal on the rocks. He held it there. And if, for maybe three or four seconds, it felt like an eternity. And he said, by the stroke of midnight, 2008, Lawrence, he says, if that bank goes down, you'll have a deal. And sure enough, here we are, September 15th. <laughs> Not long afterwards. Yeah, September 15th, 2008, Lehman goes down that night. I woke up about two in the morning. As a former distressed trader, I tiptoed to, over, over to the computer. As a former distressed trader, high yield bond trader, a lot of times through my career, I went over to that computer in the middle of the night. And I'm looking for the bad news. So were you working at Lehman by the stage where you left? I just left. Right. But um, I, I had you know, a lot of my, I, what were called restricted stock units. You couldn't sell these stuff. You could try to hedge it. We, you know, we try to hedge our position, but it, it had a lot of stock. And, um, and it was really a life-changing moment when I saw that Lehman had filed bankruptcy. And... Uh, you know, I was holding my wife there in the middle of the night in the living room. It was a, it was a very tough, dark time. And, uh, you know, I said to myself, uh, I, I will, the next morning I was, I called Patrick and I said, uh, you know, I had a chip to call in. I said, leave it. And he said, Larry, come on over here tomorrow night for dinner. And I said, you're on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean. He was about an hour and a half outside of London in Berkshire. And uh, the next morning I found myself on the tarmac of uh, Newark Airport. And as the plane is racing down the runway, 50 miles an hour, 60 miles an hour, 80 miles an hour, 100 miles an hour, wheels up. And I'll never forget sitting back, thinking, what on earth am I doing? I mean, I'm a high yield bond salesman. I'm risking everything. I'm, I, want, I wanted to bring the unvarnished tale of what happened to Lehman to the world, but I was terrified. And, uh, Why but, were you terrified? Because of your reputation of bringing, slinging a bit of mud and stuff like that? Is that yeah, just of, of, of kind of the change in direction of, of what I might have to say. I didn't, I'd never written a book. No. But as the plane banked toward the northeast, it had rained that morning and there were some raindrops on the, on the window. And I looked out and I looked down and there's the green and white of Lehman in Times Square. And uh, I said to myself, it's time to go pick a fight. <laughs> and, uh, and it was, yeah, it was about, it was about reaching out to, because I was a, I was a, I wasn't a high level executive. So I had, I needed to have the relationships with the senior people around the firm to really figure out what was happening inside. And as you peel back the onion, you know, if you peel back uh, at the center of the onion, you really get close to the skull and crossbones to see what really happened inside the bank. So how did you get buy-in from the people within Lehman to do this? Well, they, they were just angry, I guess. Well, there were so many of them. And there was, remember, it was a period where a lot of the people were taking some time off and wanted to be with family. So you had that 
It's like if, 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 if the financial crisis didn't exist, then you know, they would have been back to work. So there was, there was a group of people, probably like 50, 60 people helped me put it together. Huh. And they were all, at the end of the day, there was this large group of people that were doing so many good things and there were so many great businesses within Lehman that had nothing to do with the failure of Lehman. To, to me, for every dollar we were making, there was one point where our group made close to $2 billion on the short side in 2007 as our group, but for every $1 we were making, they were losing eight or $9 upstairs. Wow. So it's, uh, it's really uh, a lot of lessons there, but it, it allowed me to change uh, my lifestyle quite a bit. And so what was the book called? A Colossal Failure of Common Sense. Uh, we sold, uh, I tell my wife once a month, I said, honey, uh, if we sell a million books, we'll break even on our Lehman stock. <laughs> And I think we're up to about six hundred thousand. That's interesting. a lot, yeah. right? In books, it's, it's, it's a lot. In they financial, don't sell books. a lot. Yeah, they do not sell a lot. It's interesting. And, and the best part is, we've done one hundred and forty speeches in sixteen countries. And there's certain countries in the world, like Canada, uh, Australia, that have a large financial component in their economy. Uh, it's South Africa. So we've done events around the world, met some very interesting people, and it's been quite rewarding to go from a bank where you're kind of stuck with this. You know, nice group of people in a, in a broader group, but then to kind of take what you've learned uh, the way you have, which has been so inspiring, uh, take what you've learned uh, and then bring it out to that wider audience and help people. Yes, yeah, so you're now writing research. Yes. So talk a bit about that, and then we'll, we'll dig into some of your ideas and what you're thinking about. You know, there's no I in team. So there's, we have a wonderful group of people in, in Washington that, that, that we've been working with since 2010, ACG Analytics. And so we have an institutional business where we help people with the Puerto Rico trade, hedge funds, asset managers, Venezuela. So you're mainly looking distressed? Uh, well, that's yeah, That's a large component of event-driven. Event-driven. Event-driven okay, yeah. research, uh, but also macro. So things like populism with Europe. We have a, a nice business there where we've really got out. We made a really good call in the Euro in January and the bear trap support around getting short that Euro ahead of the Italian elections. Yep. And looking for those kind of, you know, really taking the trips. You know, a lot of people, and I'm, and I'm sure you've seen this on the street, the problem with Wall Street research, when it comes to Washington and politics, they all try to wing it from New York. You know, they don't take the trips to DC. Now, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in Washington eight, nine times a year. We'll take the clients around the hill. We'll do the trips to uh, ACG. We've done trips to, uh, during the Greek crisis, we did four different trips with ACG Analytics into Athens to meet, uh, you know, meet the potential incoming government. Huh. Uh, before Argentina, uh, we did a trip to Argentina to meet with um, some of the new representatives of the Macri team. And that was an, occasionally, there's, well not occasionally, usually once every two or three years, there's an election, like Brazil. Yeah. We've been working uh, pretty closely with the Bolsonaro government and, and where you get a game-changing moment that just secular changes all of capitalism in that country. And if you're positioned in the bonds or the equities in the right spots, uh, the profits are just spectacular. So where are you seeing the opportunity now? If you're looking across the world, whether it's it's right here, right now, or coming up, where is a regime shift? Whether you know whether it's how country looks at capitalism, you know. Well, we're still in the early stages in Brazil. We did a we did a bear traps report in September, which we put up on the Real Vision platform. It was a really nice report, and it got into um, the amount of capital that's in the public hands. And when you when you're taking capital within the government and then privatizing it. So you're in the early stages of privatization in, in Brazil. At the same time, the Bolsonaro government, most of Wall Street, they were convinced that he was as toxic as, as Trump, right? And that, that was the pitch. And that he wouldn't be able to get pension reform passed through the, through the legislature in Brazil. And that's turning out to be, I think, not true. And so if they get pension reform done, then you're saving about a trillion in real of interest for the government. So your credit quality goes up dramatically. Mm -hmm. So at the same time, inflation, for a number of reasons, inflation in emerging market countries has come way down. So that takes tremendous pressure off of the Central Bank of Brazil to hike rates. So what's been happening in recent, the last 10 years, is every time Brazil's economy gets cooking, inflation picks up, 
and the government, uh, the Selleck rate, what they call the rate, the, the number of rate hikes, vicious, yep. That, yep. That, that really knocked the fire out of the economy. And now... And there's a lot of credit in Brazil, um, household credit and... Oh, yes, sector, private that's, sector that's, debt, that's right. another element of it. They're in the, they're in probably in 1950s were the U.S. In terms, in terms of really the development of household credit. There's some, there's some household credit, but it's really not wide, as wide as I, I think like in America. So if that household credit situation uh, expands and improves and works its way through the economy. At the same time, you have the central bank that is that is more in control and not, you know, aggressively hiking. And uh, and at the same time, you've got this political element. I, th I think Brazil equities could be next, it's say five years, could be up another 100% from here. Yeah. But I guess it depends on the global cycle. I mean, yeah. you know, emerging markets are great when you get the right point of the cycle or the wrong point in the cycle, and, you know, it's all overridden. Yes. So what else are you looking at on the horizon of, of the big picture stuff? And then we, we can go into some of the sp more specific opportunities as well. Well, uh, the populism is still, I mean, it, it's, it's an old trade in some respects. It's had cycles. I mean, you had that first cycle in 2016 with Brexit and, um, and then U.S. with Trump. Uh, but now, uh, you, you know, you had this, you know, the, the globalists were very empowered by the Macron election because when he was elected, it really looked like populism was, was going to be at least contained in Europe. But now... He looks like he was the outlier, in fact. Yes, exactly. And at the time, that's the amazing thing. About, the street was lecturing us that this whole movement was dead, right? This whole populist movement. In the summer of 2000... Because people wanted it. What's that? It's because they were imposing their wants, exactly. their desires. That is... And you've been picking up on this for years, is you see these research reports that... Over and, and, and Trump brought it out in people, and it's, it's it's very popular around the world today. Is that your research is driven with the political um, bent, where it, it it really warps the reality of the research, and so it's to, to us, you know, we're really we're, we want to do trips to Italy, uh, more trips, and meet Salvini's team. Uh, so we'll take clients over there. So I I think that the situation with Spain is fascinating because Vox is now. If you look at Europe, AFD in Germany has gone from three, four, five percent in the polls to high teens. And this is, you know, these guys make Trump look like Mary Poppins, right, on, on terms of immigration. Yeah. So, and then in Vox is, is now, in Spain is now rising, and in, in Italy you've got obviously the Liga and Five Star. So the whole thing is coming together, and you've got the, as you've, you've, talked, you've been talking about Brexit. But they've also, the, they're all bifurcating as well, so there's a... Yes. a there was an explosion in the left, in the hard left, and yes. an explosion in the hard right. And it's happening everywhere. Niall Ferguson has been on top of this. And, and um, if you look back through the history of capitalism, there are what's called a debt jubilee period. Yes. And, um, and there's a number of people that, that have been starting to... Uh, Ray Dalio is kind of hinting at this. But you're, you're right. Um, you've got this... The left is rising and the right is rising. And they're... And the left especially is very anti-creditor. So if you're in the left wing in Europe and you're a millennial, you see the uh, baby boomers of, of Europe have saddled these countries with debt. And these young people are looking at this debt load and saying, over time, each year that goes by, you know, I, I don't, at some point, there's going to be a movement strong enough to walk away from that debt. And that's, if you look back through the history of capitalism, maybe you can explain a little bit too, but... Um, through, for the last, going back to, in, in the Bible, there's references right. to debt jubilees. It's a debt reset. And I think that that's what we're heading to in the next, I think anywhere between two to five years to be some type of debt jubilee or de debt reset. I, I, you know, I, I actually agree with that too. I think uh, David Zervos has been talking about this as well. I think Japan's probably the first place to, to look at it because they're more advanced with this whole debt cycle. And the point being is the central bank already owns 60 odd percent of the debt. Yes, yes. <laughs> so at, one, at what point did the central bank in the next recession just end up owning all of the debt and then saying, what debt? It's gone, right? Yeah. That accounting trick. It, what they call it, a coin? You create a coin and do it. Yeah. <laughs> Whichever way it's done, yeah. that accounting trick is a debt jubilee, essentially. Yes. Because um, you say to the government, okay, that debt's written off now. The central bank own it. We'll call it, we'll call it quits. There will be, obviously, some repercussions what that is is probably the currency collapses um, but it, it seems to me that we can't get out of the problems we're in 
both the political problems or the economic problems we're in without it. With an ageing population, with more debt, there has to be some sort of debt to Jubilee. What that means is terrible to be a creditor. Yes. Anybody with savings gets killed, but you know, in the world of the 99% and the 1%, it actually appeases 99% of the entire population when that happens. So it's a really odd situation. As you say, it could easily happen. And Alexis de Tocqueville, and this, there's a number of, I mean, his life is, is a, I think, a Brit uh, in the Scottish, and then through his life, he wrote some, a lot of works. And there was a number of people like Alexis de Tocqueville that in the 1700s, 1800s, that talked about the cycles of capitalism, where you start off with, you start off really in a bondage period because you a period where the, uh, the U.S. was essentially contained by the U.K. Then the patriotism entrepreneurship, uh, and then a flourishing uh, abundance stage. And there are these stages that he talks about. And he's, this work is almost you know, over two, close to 200 years old. But in the end, there's the apathy stage, and then you're back to bondage. Because at the end of the day, when the voters realize they can vote themselves uh, largesse from the public treasury, and uh, that kind of left wing or that right wing extremist uh, impair the debt, which we've seen in Venezuela, we've seen to a large extent in Argent Argentina many times. There's this cycle, and um, it's pretty clear that uh, if you look at the U.S., we're moving into that apathy, that was those later stages as we move to the, to the rise of the left in the U.S. And I think um, Neil Howe's uh, fourth yes. attorney also alludes to this kind of thing. There was a phase to this, and I don't know how long that this phase lasts, how, how long the political instability and how extreme it gets, because it could get to several forms of war, because if the US pulls out, something I've talked a lot about, the US pulls out of the world political order, which it seems to be doing mm. right now, it leaves an enormous vacuum, because the Europeans are too busy trying to sort out their massive problem, with the UK pulling out, creating a vacuum there as well. There's kind of vacuums everywhere, and, and it leaves kind of Russia, China, and other players like Saudi, Iran, and Turkey yes. to kind of figure out what they want to do because who's going to stop them? I mean, Saudi can murder journalists in Turkey and nobody does anything about it. The Chinese are murdering people all the time. They've got concentration camps, but yet nobody will do anything about it. The Russians are killing people in London, yes. yet nobody will do anything about it. So that tells you that everyone's free to do whatever they want. And that worries me because that could lead to war within that. And the U.S. really debt sustainability, I mean, if you look at entitlements and interest, we're up to 62% of the budget. Whereas, it's a years ago, defense spending and versus entitlements was, was, was larger. Now, entitlements and interest on the U.S. debt is so much larger than defense. And you have to say, if 62% of the U.S. budget is entitlements and interest, Defense is going to get crowded out, and I think that's what expresses itself through. Trump is starting to starting to see that. They can, now, now, granted, Trump is, is definitely increased defense spending, but in terms of the U.S. being, like you said, the global policeman, there's no way that's financially sustainable anymore. If 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 your interest costs and your and your entitlements are sixty already sixty two percent of the debt compared to fifty years ago, they were both those two combined were twenty eight to thirty percent of the debt. Yeah. So let's pull on the thread a little bit. Of, about the populism. So I think what you said was interesting is there's a potential between the hard left and hard right to really not care about the creditors somewhere within this. Um, and that leads me on to the European banks and who's going to save these guys <laughs> in the end? And how's that going to play out? Because are they going to have to go into the public sector, I mean, the German banks, what, you know, there's the German, the Italians and the Spanish I'm really worried about right now. And how is that going to play out? I guess it depends what political party, are they just going to write them out and just blow everybody up? Are they going to supposedly bail in the creditors, which is what the rule was set, but I don't imagine the Germans are ever going to do that with Deutsche Bank. Yeah. Or are they going to take them over as government entities? How do you see that play out? Because if, if we're talking credit, Special situations, that's probably the biggest one in the world that I see. 
Well, if you think, think once again, you think of the cycles of democracy, that bondage to patriotism, to abundance, and then back to bondage. We can look right there, Venezuela's in the bondage stage, right? So the Venezuela will probably transfer into, in the next six months to nine months, to a new stage, a new moving out of bondage into maybe that new form of patriotism, kind of where, I guess you could say, where, where, where uh, Argentina is right now. Right. But Europe, um, if you talk to people in the White House, and I spend a lot of time on the Hill, after Lehman, there was a conversation or two about a real dead jubilee moment. But in the end, and this was, there was, there was literally conversation in the White House between the Obama people and you know, Treasury and the Office of Management Budget. And in the end, in that small room in the Oval Office, uh, they discussed and the, 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 the argument came down, we have to protect the banks because if you let the banks go in the United States and you cram them down because they own all this debt, uh, then, then you have a depression. Whereas, so, but we've already been through this. And, and to your point, we've been through this in Ireland. So they've, we've been through this in Europe. And now at some point when you go into the second round of the next crisis, that's when the banks probably take more of a hit. And that's where you're getting at. And that's why, this, here's the, the, the amazing thing. There are banks in this world, in Canada, that are trading at two and a half times book. And SockGen, Society General, B&P are trading at 40% a book. This is, a, this is craziness. I mean, what is going on in this world? And that's pricing in some type of, you know, that credit rate. You look at France, CDS is moving up. It's not crazy, but it's, it's France, CDS is substantially wider than uh, Germany compared to where it was like six months ago. Something's going on there. So I think number one, I think the Canadian banks are, are overpriced. But why do you have like the, you know, this, this drastic difference, two, two and a half times book versus you know, 0 0.4, 0 0.4 uh, on SockChain and BNP? The question is, is all SockChain and BNP even worth 40% <laughs> of book? Well, that's the thing. You know, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> A, I don't know how you value book any longer. Yeah. And I know SockGen, as you know, SockGen, it is an enormous derivative house of which I don't know what the black holes are in yeah. that. And so is BNP. Because the, they use their, you know, the, they have huge derivative books. When you trade, like, if, as my, my career in trading distressed and high yield, and, and the equity investor watching us right now, so many equity investors don't understand. Like in the case of Deutsche Bank, the equity might be like 16 billion but there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of billions of debt. And like you said, off-balance sheet debt, derivatives. So you're talking about potentially the sliver of equity in Deutsche Bank is this. And people look at the stock and like, oh, I can buy the stock at $12 or $11. But you're, you own this little tiny, think of a pie. You own this little tiny sliver and all of the rest of the pie is senior to you. And uh, you really, at the end of the day, like to your point, if it's priced to book, it like it looks cheap at 0 0.3 times book, right? At Deutsche Bank, maybe 0 0.2 for Deutsche Bank. Oh, it's cheap, but oh, by the way, That's look right. at the pie. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. What, and what's in that pie? Yeah, what's in that pie? If that pie's toxic as hell, you don't want to, you know, you don't even the taste of it. So, where else is interesting to you, or what else is interesting to you? What, what's on your radar screen right now, investment-wise uh, or opportunity-wise? You know, spending a lot of time on electric vehicles. Um, what I like in cycles is um, if you look at the dot com, there's this period of any new trend, any new massive uh, social economic trend, whether it be, say, the internet. Yeah. What happens is the fast money equity people come in and uh, they bid everything up. Uh, Buffett talks about the three I's, you know, the, the in innovators, and then finally the in idiots. Right. right, you know, so the three eyes, and um, and so you have this innovation stage where the money comes in, yeah, and sim similar to, 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 to crypto, uh, and then that if you look at Amazon stock, Amazon priced in 15 years worth of earnings in 1999, 2000, so you had stock went from 100 and whatever it's 100, 150 to, to, to I think close to a buck, and then back to you know through 2000, so. 
so th this, we look around the world, and if you look at electric vehicles, uh, this has already happened to some extent, not as vicious as, say, the dot-com, but you had a lot of companies in that electric vehicle space that, in the mining, lithium, uh, cobalt, these, these critical, critical um, commodities that are, that are mathematically unsustainable, like we need literally a tremendous, what I mean by is the current amount of them on planet Earth is unsustainable relative to the demand of electric vehicles. Yep. We're selling a million electric vehicles a year now in China compared to 200,000 five years ago. So the large trends, what we look for, the bear traps report is, okay, you're coming out of the euphoria stage and then you're down on impatience. And then there's that, you know, we've seen this so many times, so many different trades, up on euphoria, 10 years of goodness gets priced in, down on impatience, and what we look for at the bear traps support I kind is of think the cryptocurrency world's in that impatience <laughs> phase. <laughs> yes. all, we had the euphoria, we've now gone into the impatience, it's like nothing's ever going to happen from yeah. this, Nobody's ever, and then eventually out of this. Oh, it's going to explode out, and it'll be different players. that. And whatever survive. it is, a different yeah. format. But yeah, yeah, it's, it's all blockchain, it'll be like JP Morgan's back office will be completely, like they'll, they'll be settling trades in like two minutes, 10 years from now, right? Yeah. Like, right, how long does it take to settle a bond trade, yeah. right? three, four, five days, I mean, it gets, but over time, with blockchain, you're gonna be able to settle that trade, immediately, like both counterparties. This is the overstock with, story. Yeah. This is what people are interested in overstock. But sorry, I interrupted you there. No, just, it's, but we look for is the, that the bear trap support is is that really, that new bull market. And so we're, we did a pretty good job on solar names uh, last year, the year before. We looked for that, and, 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 and this past year, we're doing a lot of work on natural gas. And so we're looking at just the demand for electric vehicles and nuclear power in the world uh, is just massively, uh, China has to, has to at least 30, they need, if, if China doesn't produce 30 new nuclear power, nuclear power plants, the entire Paris Accord is complete fraud because it's the dirtiest air on earth. Uh, you know, the, the percentage of electricity that's produced you know, coming out of coal I mean, people, that's the thing that drives me crazy about the Davos crowd. There's so much attention on the U.S. And the dirtiest, most viciously pollutive companies and countries are in India and China. Mm -hmm. And they get this free pass in Paris. Mm -hmm. And you know what, you can say what you ever, ever say about politics, but guess what, there's a trade there. Because they may have a free pass now, and you know, that's empowered some people politically, but there's a mathematically unsustainable. That, that free pass is over in two years. But I think... China have acknowledged that. And yes. India probably also. China are faster, you know, their whole thing is about renewables and cleanness and everything. I think they understand that you can't destroy your environment any longer. Yes. That's why you need 32 nuclear power plants. Yes. And then the trade is your natural gas and uranium. Because China and India, the amount of natural gas and uranium, the demand, we've had this huge amount of, of natural gas that's found in the U.S., mainly because of the Fed, right? Fed kept, kept interest rates so low for so long, you know, billions went into the Bakken, and, and they found all this natural gas. So all of a sudden, we're sitting on this, all this natural gas, no buyers. Now, this LNG is changing the world where next five, 10 years, the, 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 the floor price for natural gas is going to be maybe... 50, 60, 70% up higher from here. Same thing with uranium. Both of those sectors in natural Why gas. Why would Nat Gas when there's so much of it? I mean, people are just tripping over Nat Gas everywhere. Well, like, like in these other economies, these power plants are, are gonna have to be Nat, nat Gas, LNG, LNG, Nat Gas uh, fueled. So- uh, but, I mean, Russia's got so much of the it stuff. Does. and. Uh, you know, there's so many places with nat gas. I'm not, I can't, I can't construct a bullish argument for nat gas prices outside of supply restrictions that come periodically. But yeah, uranium. Yes, I mean this has been a big theme for a lot of people. I think. Yeah, it's it's a harder case to make with nat gas, but coal is just so unsustainable. Yeah. And 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 the other thing is nukes. You still have that political element. Yeah. So, uh, you know, Trump is, is the one thing about the Trump administration. They know. Ch they know the U.S. can't compete with Russian natural gas, but they're, they're using NATO as leverage. Uh, look at this Nord Stream deal, right? So the, the Germans are, have this natural gas deal with Russia, but the U.S. is saying, oh, by the way, you know, we're, we're, we're basically giving 
Europe this X amount of billions of dollars a year in NATO funding, if we're going to keep that level, you're either going to have to raise your defense spending or buy our natural gas. So in that respect, uh, you're right. It's, there's too much of it. It's uneconomical, but Europe may be forced to buy a lot more. And Poland's already leaning this way. Trump's been over, over to Poland like three or four times. And mm -hmm. from what we hear, there's, there's a, a, a deal there in the natural gas is actually linked to defense, which is crazy. <laughs> this is like 21st century. Wow, wow. <laughs> animal house, <laughs> I mean, animal farm. So also in the, in the electric vehicles, so where's the opportunity within that? Albemarle, uh, the big producers in, in Latin America, there's this like triangle of, uh, of, of country, of, of regions that, that really where most of that lithium's coming from. But Albemarle is, is really an, an anchor tenant uh, position. There's the ETF, which is the LIT, uh, ETF, which is a lithium ETF. There's cobalt companies. There's uh, BYD, the electric vehicle company that Charlie Munger. Uh, great story. I've got, uh, from, I've got to tell you my Charlie Munger story. But uh, Charlie told me about, uh, he invited me to Omaha. My, the book came, my book came out in 2008, nine. And uh, 2011, he invited me to Omaha to, uh, to come and see that Berkshire Hathaway annual meeting. And I ended up going in to a number of those annual meetings. I, any investor watching us right now, you have to, first week in May, you have to. While these guys are still healthy and, and just incredibly functioning, uh, you have to get there. So I bring my wife there and um, we get off the plane, we do the cocktail parties on the Friday night. And, um, the next morning and Saturday morning, we're in the Quest Center. There's 32,000 people there. And Buffett and Munger, now remember, I was a former Lehman trader. Buffett and Munger start answering questions from the audience. And this is going on like an hour, hour and a half. And I'm, I look over at my wife, I'm getting the death stare. You know, she's hungry. And I'm like, I, should, I shouldn't have brought her on this trip. It's an investor trip. Yeah, we're with, we're this with, was for you. Yeah. And she's like, honey, I want to get some lunch. I said, and I lean over and said, what would you like for lunch? She said, oh, I'm really in the mood for, you know, New York, New York gal. I'm really in the mood for some sushi. I said, hey, we're in Omaha, Nebraska. <laughs> That's the last thing. So the next morning, <coughs> we walked through the foyer of the Marriott Hotel. We were supposed to meet one-on-one, -on -one, a meeting Charlie Munger at 9.30. And as we walked through the foyer, there's Bill Gates in one room with the Sovereign Wealth Funds. There's Buffett in another, another room with the pension funds. And... Uh, just this great group of investors in the lobby and everybody you talk to is just, uh, just it's like, it's like a, a lot of, a lot of, like this conversation, just yeah. a lot of really incredible people uh, that, that I respect and you know, really investors, you know, someone that's been in the Buffett Berkshire equity for 20, 30 years. I mean, that's a very interesting person. Yeah. And uh, so we're in the room and um, I say to my wife, I said, Annabella, I only have 25, 30 minutes with, with Mr. Munger. So please just say hi and then, you know, just gracefully leave. <laughs> you know, I didn't want to be, like, didn't want to be too, too aggressive. Uh, but just, so Charlie walks in and, and uh, he meets my wife and um, he, she's leaving. And he said, just, I just want you to know hardship is good for you. And I said, you know, Mr. Munger, you're one of the richest men in the world. What do you know about hardship? And he said, uh, years ago, and he told this, he told the story on stage too. Uh, years ago, in the 1950s, they had a law firm. You know, one day, uh, eight lawyers walked out the front door. And he woke up in the middle of the night, looked up at the ceiling. And he said, honey, if I lost everything, would you still love me? And she said, I'd love you, but I sure would miss you. <laughs> 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 and I said, I said, Mr. Mungi, you're one of the richest men in the world. What do you know about hardship? And uh, he, just the most inspiring man I've ever met. The, the burning desire of Charlie Munger every day to get up and get smarter is something to behold. And when you live through your whole life, and, I'm, and I just turned 53, you realize how much time you have. And as a young person listening to us right now, there's nothing that can stop you if you just keep that burning desire to learn, to break through those walls and get smarter every day, get smarter at your focus craft. And that's what Charlie Munger's life is all about. He's one of the most successful investors in you know, the world's ever seen. So to loop back in the, in the electric vehicle thing, he's invested in? In BYD. So right. he convinced, uh, around that time, he convinced uh, Mr. Buffett, who's not really a big technology fan, even though he's the largest shareholder of Apple now. But um, it, it's fascinating to see that vision. You know, they, they were way out in front. They were, if you look at their cost 
basis on this BYD equity. Uh, I think they own 20% of the equity now, but their cost basis, I mean, they were in there uh, way early. And um, within China, it could go really well for BYD because the, as, as the Paris Climate Accord gets priced, uh, as they enforce it in China, the companies with the highest standards and the highest, uh, the electric vehicles that with the, with the best performance and standards are going to get uh, more credits, uh, more receptive and more push from the government. And uh, so I think that's why, they, 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 that's number one, that's not their original thesis, but that's why I think they're very happy with that position because that's an equity that could be up, you know, five, six, ten bagger from here. So you'd, you'd like to be long that and short Tesla? <laughs> yes. Well, uh, I, I think the Tesla thing is, is fascinating because as a, as a former distressed trader, high yield trader, I, I've never in my life seen an, a $50 billion equity market cap. Like, think about this. I've, I've never seen a 50 to 55, 60 billion dollar equity market cap. So that's equity on an 8% or 7.5% coupon high yield bond in the same company. It doesn't make any sense. So it's just a classic tales, right? So you've got the equity people that are playing this one tail and the high yield people, uh, the, the bond pe people don't, don't buy it because if they were buying it, the bond would have, the, the coupon or the, the yield of the bonds would be because well the below the bond 5%. guys, I think, are, thi uh, are saying he's managing the company as if it's a, it's still a VC funded firm. Yes. So they're saying, but it's a public company, so you're going to run out of cash. Yeah. The equity guys are saying, yeah, but look at the upside. And they're also thinking like VC guys, thinking, yes. yeah, but there could be a 10x here. And... It's yeah. not, I don't think it's possible in the public markets for this to happen. I've never seen, maybe you could point one to me. Typically, you don't see $50 billion equity market caps and a coupon that high. Like normally, if the... If so you why a, is that not the trade then? Is just to buy the bonds and sell the equity or... Well, that's, that's why there's the converts. Now, the problem is the converts, uh, they're unsecured. And the senior secured, and then and there's other there's other pieces of debt that have a claim on those on Tesla's prize assets that the big property plant that they have on the West Coast. So and then now the, the assets that they that they're developing in China. So the, the converts could be a great play, but uh, it all depends on the, the, the recovery risk because the bonds at par, right? So think going back to the convertible bond, the Tesla bonds right around par. It may go to that's a thousand. It may go to six thousand, like to your point. That's the that's your equity component. But where's your recovery if it's a, if it's an unsecured convert with all this like bank debt and all this other debt on top of it? Maybe so. Maybe you have fifty percent downside, and but net net you have six seven hundred percent upside. It's a lot better deal than the equity. Yeah. So I'd, yeah. I'd still rather own the, the the Tesla converts, but net net uh, I'm, I'm negative on the equity. Uh, and our work shows that, and it, as there's a lot of, we, we did a beautiful a report that's, that's up on Real Vision, but it's um, the, the amount of, you're talking about four or five hundred billion dollars of investments from German, German engineering, Volkswagen, BMW, that are coming at this oh, company. I keep, I re keep writing about Can this. Can you imagine I mean, this? I mean, when you see what Porsche <laughs> la launching, what Audi are launching, what BMW are launching, I mean, they're really going for this and they've taken their time to get it right so that the doors actually fit together and yes. the car doesn't break down and you know best engineers in the world like, literally like 30,000 of the best engineers in the world are coming at Tesla but guess what if you spend a little time on the hill Elon Musk is a genius politically he spent a ton of time on the hill hmm. he really ing ingratiated himself with the Obama presidency and the subsidies the American taxpayer, if they knew, if they saw the subsidies in Tesla through that creation, the, tax, the average taxpayer would just faint. I mean, it's just billions of dollars of subsidies. But guess what? He's very close with Kevin McCarthy, who's, who's Kevin McCarthy's um, in the House Minority Leader. And you've got this 232 coming out of the Trump administration now, and they just announced on autos, the auto tariffs, they just announced the plan on February 17th, but they haven't given the details. Lo and behold, there'll be some protection for U.S. electric vehicles, I think, coming out of that.
White House. But, really? So, so because think how like, think of, think of like your Elon Musk. You know this this twenty thousand German engineers are coming at you. You know there's two three hundred billion dollars of investment that's coming at you in the electric vehicle space coming out of Europe. To your point, the Porsches, the most incredible Porsches are coming. At, the only way you can survive is if you get your boys in Washington to protect you with tariffs for the next two, three, four years. I thought this government's supposed to be anti-tariffs. Oh, yeah. Be, I think that if you look at 232, it won't be, and this is, remember, we're talking about the U.S. auto tariff uh, agenda that's coming out, and it'll be much more of a sniper fire than a shotgun. So the tariffs, like the markets, so this is why, we, we did a report on BMW. The spread between BMW equity and GM is two standard deviations outside the norm going back 10 years. It's never been this cheap to GM, ever. So you, you, I think German cars could be a real, uh, German auto, like BMW equity could be a real buy here because at the end of the day, it's a lot like Mexican equities. The Trump, Trump gets elected. He makes all this news on the wall. Mexican equities drop 60, 50%. We were buying them for clients because the Trump bark a lot of times is worse than the bite. And the media coverage on the bark is so profound that these vicious sell-offs occur. And at the end of the day, you've got all this news on auto tariffs, all this negative news on BMW. And if they come up with selected tariffs that, that won't hurt BMW as much as what's been priced in, you're talking about a stock that could be up 60, 70, 100% over the next three, four years. Well, the other way of looking at it is that when I look at car sales around the world, they're collapsing. Yes. The US is, is also slow, not the yep. end of the world yet, but it seems to be slowing down. Why was it if it's just GM that's massively overpriced? Well, um, there's some pretty impressive investors that have stakes in GM. Like, uh, to me, uh, I, I just love David Einhorn and uh, his career, even though he had a bad year last year. Uh, the work that, that some of these investors that have done on GM, uh, their incoming entrance to electric vehicles in, in China, uh, the growth, the, the, the potential deal with a GM and I think uh, Amazon. You know, there's, there's all types of disruptive forces that, that could eventually help GM, but it, it, you can make the case that, you know, I'm not, a, I'm not, I don't, we don't, we don't really have a strong opinion on GM equity, mm. but um, it, it, I do think though, it's, it's Cause much. I'm just thinking maybe, again, like we were talking with the Tesla one, maybe the, the smarter thing here to isolate the, the, the actual risk and opportunity outside of the macro is to do the long short, the pairs trade. Yeah, I, I love, I, 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 well, you, yeah. Because yeah. if it's two standard deviations, Yes, no, exactly. I see. If you're short GM and long BMW, yeah, that, that's going to normalize. That, that'll work for sure. Now, whether it I, happens I, I that, that GM share price yeah. falls or BMW rallies, what you're taking is the, is the market risk out of it. Yeah, t take a look. We, like, we, there's an HS screen on Bloomberg, which, and, and you, you pull it up and you look back, and it's just, we've never seen. That's, that gets back to that politics. That's why I think the political element of, of research is so important because whether it be elections or whether it be tariffs or whether it be the, the, the noise is so loud from the press. And, this, and remember, there's a disruptive element in the press. You know, BuzzFeed, out of business, right? The New York Times had financing from Carlos Slim, which potentially saved the company, and now the company's flourishing. The point is that the U.S. media is being massively disrupted. So the clickbait, you know, the ability to issue a story and get eyeballs on it is now much more important than it ever was before because of the, these really historic disruptive forces in media. So what that means is there are these trades that get viciously, and we have a capitulation model that measures capitulation. You know, as we, we look at these different sectors. Is this a category three hurricane capitulation. And you can mathematically quantify the capitulation. And what we found, especially with Mexican equities, with Brazil uh, last year, ahead of that election, the stories about Bolsonaro in Brazil, you know, they made this guy, I mean, he, he looked like, this guy looked like Darth Vader coming in. And equities, and then you had a bunch of, bunch of things going on in Brazil at the same time uh, with, with trucker strikes and everything. But the bottom line is the negative narrative because of this media disruption, yeah. I think is profoundly uh, expanded more so than it ever existed 
5, 10, 15 years ago. So what happens is the capitulation process in this vicious bear market can be so severe and the exiting, and then sure enough, lo and behold, it pr these produces a, a fantastic bull market. Brazil equities are up since October, 30, 40 percent, 35%, and the U.S. equities are flat. So you've had 35% outperformance of Brazil versus the U.S. since October, all because of this whole, you know, this politicization of, 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 uh, of information. So just a, as a final thing, sure. where's the next big political opportunity? Well, it's definitely Venezuela, but there's no, it won't be tradable for a while, right? So um, then we have to look at, uh, you know, around the world. What about Europe? Does that, anything change? I think that there'll be, in Europe, you could have a situation with Merkel where if she exits, your German equities are so cheap to the US. I think you can go back 20 years, they're one of the cheapest they've ever been. For, and what we look at for the bear trap support is like multiple levels of capitulation. So you've got a capitulation, remember, remember German equities, um, there's a decent chunk of them that are exposed to autos, right? Mm -hmm. So that's part of it. And then you have the potential Merkel exit. You've got all this problems in the periphery. So German equities relative to the US, if you hold, buy German equities now and hold for five years, I think you're gonna be in a, in a pretty good spot to some extent. Now the banking situation is, 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 is an overhang, but it's very well known. And maybe that plays out over a longer period of time. But maybe over the next two years, that could be the real situation. Because think about it, they're also, European equities, especially Germany, has been crushed by this Trump trade drama with China. Because you're talking about Germany's largest trading partner. And today, we just saw manufacturing PMI down with a 47 handle coming out of Germany. I mean, they're in recession. Yeah. So they're, these stocks are cheap, and uh, the risk reward in German equities. I mean, you've got a Merkel exit price in. You've got a China uh, you know, potential recession that's been priced in over the last year in the German equities. You've got all this political risk. You've got the Trump trade tariffs. I mean, you're talking about every investor, sane investor, has been knocked out of Germany. There's nobody left to sell. Hmm. Fascinating. <laughs> Larry, the really <laughs> fascinating conversation. I think people are going to get a lot out of this and hopefully some, some thinking and some inspiration as well. So just thank you so much. And it's a pleasure. Look forward to seeing more of you on Real Vision. And, and you've, been, you've been a great inspiration to so many of us on, on the street. And uh, I, love your, I love your quality of life. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Good to see you. Good to see Thanks, you. Thanks, my friend. So as I thought, you know, a charming interview with Larry. Great conversation. Lots of stories to be told. But I think there's some really interesting stuff is how he's looking at the capitulation phase of various markets. I think that was one of the key learnings for me. I look at these kind of things as well. I call them bombed out markets. And it's the same kind of idea where something gets so oversold and the people have got fallen so out of love with something that it becomes a great opportunity. And Larry's clearly looking at many of these situations around the world. Now, who knows how the macro plays out? But the relative valuations of things are really where the interest lies. And I, I think he talks a lot about the relative valuation of Europe. Whether that's a value trap or not is difficult to be seen. Or maybe the US is overvalued. But again, using his framework of understanding of the cheapness of this and where it is within his cycles, I think was super interesting. Again, the same with the, um, with the electric vehicles market and the opportunities that that presents itself, or even with natural gas. So lots of learnings from Larry, really fascinating interview, and we'll see a lot more of Larry on Real Vision in due course. Thank you for watching this interview. This is just a taste of what we do at Real Vision. To learn more about the complex world of finance, business, and the global economy, click on the membership link in the description. Give us seven days to change your life. This will be the best dollar you ever invest.